All right, welcome committee. Um, we've, we've had some technical um, issues that we've been working out, so, but I think that we're good to go and we'll have everything worked out um, as we go along. So uh, I call to order uh, this meeting of the House Education Policy Me uh, Committee and there is a quorum present. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes. Uh, Representative Joachim, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes and if so, would you uh, motion to approve the minutes from Tuesday, February 14th? Yes, I have, Madam Chair. They look fine. I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes for February 14th. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Joachim. Um, any discussion, comments on the minute from February 14th? All right, seeing none, all in favor of approving the minutes, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Are Our first opposed? bill is House Let's File 14, 1547. Let's and Representative Feist, if you'll set yourself up there. Thank you. Uh, Member, it's our intention to re-refer this bill to Education Finance. Um, Rep Representative Feist, would you like to motion your bill before the committee to be re-referred to um, Education Finance, House File 1547? Yes, Madam Chair, I couldn't have said it better. That is my motion. Thank you. All right, Representative Feist moves House File 1547 before the committee to be re-referred to the bill, the, to re-refer the bill to Education Finance. Now that the bill is before us, Representative Feist, Please introduce yourself for the record and please proceed. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Sandra Feist, uh, Representative 39B, member of this committee. Very excited to be presenting to you today the compensatory revenue bill. Um, so um, input has been solicited and will continue to be solicited. I'm really excited for this conversation we're going to have today about this important bill. Um, so compensatory revenue um, is de designated funds to help students who are underprepared to learn and not meeting academic performance standards. Um, to give you a sense of scale, um, in the 2023-24 school year, um, there is an estimated $763 million um, in compensatory revenue, um, which is 8.1 total of the statewide general education budget. Um, this proposal is to get us um, to 100% uh, of compensatory revenue um, count in a post free and reduced lunch form world. Um, we know um, that uh, currently um, the Medicaid direct certification um, plus um, SNAP and MFIP gets us to about 90% of the students that we intend to target with these dollars. Um, and the goal of this bill is to make sure that 100% of those kids are being counted. Um, this bill also works in a number of recommendations from the Office of the Legislative Auditor, um, because if we're doing one thing, we might as well do all the things that, that they have recommended um, that we think uh, collectively are a good idea. Um, so I will run through briefly what this bill does. Um, first and foremost, it is um, replacing the free and reduced lunch proxy um, with an additional formula. So um, this bill proposes that we rely on the Medicaid direct certification plus SNAP, MFIP, et cetera. Um, and then also add to that formula um, ELL up to 4%, um, high mobility numbers up to 2%, and um, collection of forms up to 4%. And uh, if we, as we continue the discussion, um, Tim Strom can explain that in more detail if folks would like. Um, but the goal here is to use um, those numbers from our ELL and our home mobility um, to get us again um, from 90% of the count that we're currently at to 100% of the count um, in a way that does not force schools to rely on free and reduced lunch forms exclusively that are going to be um, unnecessary because we are hopefully moving to universal meals. Um, so the, the explanation, just to give a little bit of detail, um, the ELL numbers we thought were a really good measure because they really do reflect the types of students that we are trying to target with these dollars. And they also may be underrepresented in the current numbers just because a lot of um, new American communities feel a little bit less comfortable sharing some of their information. And so we thought that information might be slightly harder to collect. Um, high mobility numbers are pretty well reflected in the Medicaid direct certification. So we cap that at up to 2%. Um, and then the forms um, are up to 4%. So 
we think that will get us to 100%, um, but looking forward to input on that. Um, note that we did, decided against using census data, which is like a really straightforward measure, but would become increasingly out of date over each decade. Um, also, it's not necessarily indicative of the student body makeup in a particular school. Um, and uh, there's another option that we considered, which would be to allow schools to collect free and reduced lunch forms all year round, which apparently would help us get those numbers up, but would kind of be a burden on schools. So we didn't, we decided not to go with that. So there are, there is a spreadsheet that I have with me of all the ways you could go about doing this. Um, we settled on our formula, but really open to input from this committee. Um, we also, um, changed uh, the rule that the amount, the compensatory dollars currently have to be spent at least 50% at the generating site. Um, we raised that to 70%. Um, and the rationale is just that we wanna make sure that these dollars that are targeting these specific students really are getting to the students who have generated that funding um, and are not diffused over the school district. Um, we also made some changes to the reporting requirements um, at the recommendation of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, specifically, um, schools are currently required to report how those dollars uh, tied to student achievement, which is kind of an impossible task and hard to quantify. So instead, we um, changed that to um, require schools to talk about um, the verification that the expenditures were uh, consistent with best practices. And connected to that, we ask MDE to identify best practices so that schools can benefit from that, um, that resource. Um, we eliminated the requirement that uh, the schools reserve a portion of their compensatory funding for extended time revenue or extended time programs. Um, and that, again, was a recommendation of the OLA. Um, we didn't do some really technical stuff that I won't talk about because we didn't do it in the end. Um, and then also, and I think a place where we'll want to spend a lot of time today in discussion is we looked at the 12 acceptable uses of compensatory revenue um, and we narrowed those accept acceptable uses in a way that is um, consistent with targeting students who really need to be most um, supported by these extra uh, expenditures or ex extra funding. So um, that is what the bill does. Um, and like I, I said, this is kind of the beginning of the conversation. I've had a lot of conversations with every colleague and stakeholder who would meet with me, um, but a lot of people kind of wanted to see like what the bill looked like and then provide input. So um, this is our starting place. Um, I'm really happy with it. I'm proud of it. I think it, it is the it is reflects a lot of thought and work, but it's just the beginning of the conversation. And um, I'm excited to hear what everyone's thoughts are. And I'll be taking copious notes and probably watch the video again later. And I'll, I know that there are some members of the public who wanted to testify. All right. Thank you, Representative Feist. First up, I have Matt Schaefer. Chair Pryor, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Matt Schaefer. I'm a teacher and the policy director at Ed Allies. Happy Compensatory Revenue Day to you all. I'm here to testify in support of House File 1547 and want to thank Representative Feist for her multi-year leadership and vision in working to improve the best tool we have in Minnesota to equitably resource schools serving students in poverty. Ed Allies strongly supports Section 2, which is a thoughtful proposal to identify compensatory generating students that direct certification may not find. As a reminder, nearly all Minnesota students who qualify for free and reduced price meals, as well as generate compensatory revenue, do so through direct certification. We also support the narrowing and focusing of the uses of the funds as outlined in section three, keeping as much of the additional funds generated by students at the school site they attend, as noted in section four, and in section six, an effort to work toward phasing out the inaccurate and unnecessary use of paper forms for the purpose of compensatory revenue. I'm going to cede the rest of my testimony time because I know that there are members of the public who are parents, students, and educators who came here today hoping to testify on a subsequent bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next up, Sarah Burt. And please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Burt, lobbyist with Education Minnesota. We support the approach in House File 1547 to address the need for adjustments to the compensatory revenue formula. Through expanding the number of students that would be counted in the compensatory revenue formula to include measures beyond direct certification, this puts in place some mechanisms to ensure 
fewer kids will be missed um, in the state count as the state migrates to a new system of calculating compensatory revenue. Moving away from the system of collecting a paper form from families removes a key barrier to this funding getting to the buildings where students need the extra support. I've heard stories from some of our members that around the deadline for these forms to be turned in, they would take time after work to help the district reach these families. They were happy to pitch in because they knew how valuable it was to get an accurate count of families who would benefit from free and reduced price lunch. However, they're at capacity in their current roles and they'll be relieved to know their students will still be counted. The targeted uses of compensatory revenue in this bill will help further direct resources towards the opportunity gap from the earliest ages to high school students. We know the students in these school communities need extra support to reach the state standard level for achievement in core content areas. This bill directs funding at that area. We know these students need more individual instruction, and this bill would fund that through funding more teachers and teaching aids, more team teaching, which will result in lower instructor to learner ratios. Directing funding into classrooms to ensure more individualized instruction is good for our students and is a crucial tool to retaining teachers. We also support the focus on funding programs that relate to reducing truancy and investments in meeting the social and emotional needs of our students through providing more school counselors, social workers, and guidance counselors. Thank you to Representative Feist for working on a targeted approach to directing resources to these students and the caring adults in their school communities. At the end of the day, there are public school students behind these numbers, and we really appreciate your strong advocacy for them. Thank you, Ms. Bird. Scott Kuhnquist. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can say your name. Just some days I have trouble getting it out. And please identify yourself for the records and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Scott Kronquist. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Metropolitan School Districts. We represent 50 school districts and intermediate districts that collectively enroll more than half of the state's public school students. Uh, first, I want to thank Representative Feist very much for her work on House File 1547. Uh, she has been tireless in, in this endeavor in trying to solve uh, this critical issue. Compensatory revenue is a very important funding stream for our school districts. And actually for years now, we've tried to identify better metrics um, and move away from the very burdensome and kind of cumbersome collection of the uh, pre reduced price lunch forms. Now, however, with the move towards universal meals, there is a real urgency to uh, go in this direction. Otherwise, we have school districts that will literally lose millions of dollars in compensatory revenue. Now, I know there's been some estimate that up to 90% of uh, eligible students could be identified through the direct certification. However, I will tell you that we recently completed a survey of our member districts, and we do have members that have indicated that 20% or more of their students will not be identified um, absent uh, the, the old method of um, filling out the form. And so that's why it's even more important that we move forward with um, a, a proposal like Representative Feist, House File 1547, and identify additional metrics. Uh, we have had a chance to get some very preliminary feedback from a few districts, and we think we still need to probably make a few tweaks, um, just because uh, some are indicating that they'll still come up a little bit short under the proposed method. Just one other quick issue, Madam Chair. Um, we do have a few districts that do have a problem with um, moving from the 50 to 70% of revenue being required at the site. Uh, we have a concentration formula that det determines compensatory. And thus, some um, buildings generate very little revenue, although they still have students with significant needs in those buildings. Um, but they will not have enough revenue at that site. If you continue to let your school boards have the ability to do, do a local plan, they can ensure that all students receive the resources and the services that they need. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Appreciate the time, and we appreciate Representative Feist's work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have no more testifiers on this particular bill. Um, so we will move to member discussion, and we welcome member discussion. Yes, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Representative Feist. I'm just, just wondering, you know, we, about uh, half of our students are grade level proficient in reading and fewer than half in math. Um, is there any correlation with the uh, uh, compensatory revenue programs and uh, doing anything to impact that? <laughs> 
Representative Feist. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just trying to go to where we talk about kind of the change in acceptable uses. Um, and definitely, um, we know that issues like like literacy, as we, we talked about in our last committee hearing, um, are, are a critical issue for, for these low-income students. And I'll, I'll just read again kind of what the compensatory dollars are intended to target. It's designated funds to help students who are underprepared to learn and not meeting academic performance standards. So those are the students we're trying to provide these extra supports for. And so um, looking at the bill, we looked at line 4.28, and I believe this was in in the existing list of 12 acceptable uses already. Um, but we talk about remedial instruction in reading, language arts, mathematics, and other content areas, or study skills to improve the achievement level of these learners. Um, I know when I was looking at this list, I thought about adding in literacy specifically, and I felt like it was kind of implicit. But if you do have input on how you think that we could better target like the acceptable uses to make sure that we are providing that extra like literacy and mathematics, like basic supports for these students, um, I would definitely be open to them. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Feist. I'm just you know, glad that you are focusing on that area, uh, that you know, it's important to, to have positive outcomes based on, on the spending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Representative Mueller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Erdahl, for asking that question. Um, I guess I just have some concerns, and, and maybe it's just my ignorance because I was a classroom teacher and I wasn't in charge of having to do any of these any of this type of reporting that you are now changing. Um, it does say you you highlighted it in your testimony of 6.12. A district may also report when. Um, Programs are funded with compensatory revenue, are consistent with best practices demonstrated to improve student achievement, and you cross out levels. So I know you had Representative Erdahl look at the uses of compensatory funding, but we've had compensatory funding for years, and um, if we're not, and the purpose of it is to make sure that we're helping our students who are struggling and are not coming prepared. Um, how will we know this is actually working if we remove the specific reporting mechanism? Representative Feist. Yep, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so um, I think the way the language was written originally is basically impossible for an individual school to do. And that was why the Office of the Legislative Auditor really specifically said that that language should be changed. Um, they said, um, unreasonable requirement for determining impact. Although statutes require school districts to annually report compensatory revenues impact on student achievement, the requirement is unrealistic. Isolating the effects of a single revenue stream requires rigorous research methods that are at best impractical for school districts. And so that is why we changed this specific recording re requirement. Um, but I do agree that there should be some, like there should be mechanisms that we should support at the legislature to kind of understand like how our education budget works to impact student achievement to address the opportunity gap. And if you do have specific input on that line, like I'm very open to it, um, but that's why it's, it is the way it is. Great, thank you. Representative Mueller. Yeah, and maybe we can, thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe we can ask uh, nonpartisan staff to just, I don't know what this reporting was like before and what it's going to change to, and um, maybe that's something we need to talk about offline, but I know as a specific teacher, I'm able to record how things, and I hear what you're saying with the auditor of, you know, we can't specifically look at a specific revenue stream. I get that. But if that's what these are for, you know, if that's the purpose of these, then we better make sure that they are doing what they said they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I know as a teacher, I'm able to really look down very specifically on how my students are learning, how they're achieving. And so maybe if I could just throw that question to nonpartisan staff and let them give me a little bit more detail, that would be right. great. So, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, as Representative Feist highlighted for you, um, the way it was written in statute originally was to say it was this particular funding stream you have to show the result tied to that funding stream as opposed to everything else that your school district is doing. And I think that that's where um, the, the OLA report said that this was unrealistic to do. Um, is there a comment from um, nonpartisan staff that adds to this discussion at this point? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, Mueller, I think 
you you've captured the the nature of the OLA uh, concerns with that. The, I, I believe portions of the OLA report are in our packet here, but the, uh, uh, separately, why don't I make sure that uh, all the committee members have a link to that report and their discussion about why they thought that was uh, an unachievable way for the legislature to measure that. Mm -hmm. Thank Representative Mueller. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, I, and I understand that. I, I just don't know what it was before and what it would be changed to and just to make sure that it actually is doing it. As I said, I understand what OLA is saying, and I thank you, Mr. Strom, for, for doing that. And, I, um, and Representative Mueller, I think your microphone is maybe oh, not. JK. Not, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I have a teacher voice. Through. You can't hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Surprising. No, and I, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strom, and I, and I appreciate that. As I said, uh, I don't know how it was recorded before, and I just wanted to know what it would look like after the recommendation has been has been uh, changed just to know that we're seeing a correlation mm -hmm. so right. thank you and we can check on that <coughs> i appreciate that further yeah we i think i think that is a good one to follow up more in detail off, offline and um, I, i'm a uh, representative you akeem thank you madam chair and i just want to make note too for members that it will be coming to ed finance mm -hmm. um, because we will have an appropriation here that deals with the changing of the percentage to make up for um, the students that might be missed by the forms um, I'll have to ask about how that interacts with concentration because that's the first time I've heard about it and we've been talking about this for months so we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how that works um, but no I just wanted to point out um, thank Representative Feist for pointing out the OLA report because that's what kind of kicked off this whole discussion in uh, even before we were talking about universal meals it was kind of, they were kind of both happening at the same time but we knew that if we did one, we'd have to look at the other as well. So this has been a long process for you, and we've talked through a lot of like what's what we've um, how we're directing it. But I I do maybe it's just maybe your answer on the reporting. I don't know if a school district's um, ready to come up and chat about it. But from the way I'm reading this language, it actually gives you a little more flexibility on that reporting. So do you want to, any? I'm seeing nods, but it'd be nice <laughs> to have it on record is what I'm saying. <laughs> Mr. Krunkris, thank you <laughs> for coming forward. Uh, Madam Chair, Scott Krunkris with the Association of Metro School Districts. And yeah, Representative you came. I, I agree. I, we think that is workable, the, the proposed language in there. In the legislation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, Representative Bakeberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Feist. Um, just a couple questions that I've gotten from people. Um, and, and, and then, Representative Feist, I think you and I have just briefly touched on this, but how do extracurricular activities play into this? Um, currently, it's my understanding the high school league uses uses some of this for the, the classification for what level or what what class uh, a school competes at. So um, so I think that's, I don't expect an answer, but it's something to that we need to be thinking about because a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of schools are asking about that. So. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Feist. Do, do you mind clarifying actually? Because at first I thought you were talking about extended time programming, but I feel like that's not what you're talking about and I want to make sure that I and the committee understands. Yeah, so what I'm, thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Representative Bakeberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so like my uh, local school district competes in football at 5A. Um, there's, a, there's a factor in the, the level, whether they're 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, or 5A, um, and part of that is um, is free and reduced. So there's a lot of buzz about how right. that is. And then, so if I may um, clarify your questions for my understanding um, and to understand the work that we're doing, they use the free and reduced yes. lunch. They don't directly go to the compensatory formula, but, and I think, um, what Representative Feist and I have talked about that Representative Feist is working on is finding out the other places in statute that reference using that measure of the free and reduced lunch um, as opposed to what we also have right now, which is um, direct certification 
as a means. And so we know that this doesn't solve all of the issues related to, um, it, this is a huge one and it's the most important, but we have some more work to do also if we're not requiring those forms. And I'll let uh, Representative Feist also, because it's, it's another bill, uh, Representative Feist. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, that is like my side hobby <laughs> these days is figuring out all the ways that free and reduced lunch forms manifest in, in our schools and elsewhere um, and, and kind of figuring out what we can do as a legislature to address them. So I would love to talk with you about that some more. Right, and I'm hoping that that with some good work you can be a co-author because you will know that it's the bill <laughs> that's getting the job done in a way that really serves the purpose that we have right now for free and reduced <coughs> lunch, but that we move forward and move beyond those forms. And as Representative Feist noted, schools know right now that we're not really reaching everybody we wanna reach with that form right now in our system that we're using. So it's an area, no matter what, um, that we'd be looking to try to improve on and would really um, invite your participation on that. So thank you, Representative Bigbrook, for bringing that up in this context. Yeah, just one more quick Yes, question. please thank, proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the concerns that was brought up from, um, from some of the superintendents that I talked with about it was professional development no longer being tied into it. Mm -hmm. So maybe just something um, to talk about because in order to implement things with fidelity, mm -hmm. uh, the professional development is, is critical and we can have the best program, but if we don't train our teachers, our kids aren't going to learn. In the end of the day with this money, we want our kids to learn and grow. So mm -hmm. PD is a really important piece. All right, thank you Representative Bigberg and I think that's um, an excellent point to be raising on the policy committee and I but I hope that if, if we don't get it solved um, and that it's something that we finish working on in the in the ed finance that that's acceptable yeah thank you um, a comment uh, representative Feist. sure yeah um, I, I definitely um, I appreciated our email exchange and definitely um, I can I can wait until side conversation's done. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I appreciate that input. Um, I think that I would love to have conversation with you about the professional development and how we can make sure that it is, it is professional development that kind of supports the mission of these specific dollars. Um, but I definitely agree that that is important, just part of the big picture, mm -hmm. making sure all students are supported, so. Thank you. Representative Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, first I wanna thank Representative Feist for carrying this bill. I represent a school district that was very happy. We uh, passed universal uh, meals, but they were also concerned about uh, the compensatory aid portion. So thank you for carrying this. Um, I, I just, yeah, wanna want say that. And then um, the other piece is, um, you know, I, I love the conversation about um, making sure that we um, are cutting back on, on paperwork and streamlining the uh, administrative piece of this. Um, if we'll, we'll, you know, if the committee members will recall um, our discussion on Representative Jordan's bill, um, you know, had a, um, I think a, a current parent who was a child in a family that, um, you know, would have qualified for free lunch had her parent um, been able to fill out the form. And so um, I think getting rid of this, this paper process means that we're able to help those students who, who need the aid the most. And I mean, obviously it's, it's a fairness uh, question for schools and school districts that serve these students. Um, and obviously also like the meals, we get to feed the students, right? But, um, you know, I, 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 I love that like this bill actually ensures that we capture everyone who we're missing because as we all know, um, the beginning of the school district is a very chaotic time for teachers, parents, and students alike. And, um, you know, if you are a parent that would benefit from aid like this, right, or would qualify, you're probably working, you know, two jobs and you don't have time for this extra piece. So thank you. See, no, uh, Representative Bennett. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thanks, Representative Feist, for addressing compensatory funding. I, this is important, um, and I think some of the changes in here are good, changing how, uh, you know, getting rid of the paper, pencil type things and getting on into the electronic world, making that easier for schools and so on. That's very important. Um, two issues, though, that I see here, one, one being that we are actually increasing the revenue disparities between school districts when, when we're making these changes um, to where, and I'll just give you an example. Um, so in FY23, the statewide average for compensatory revenue per pupil 
was about five hundred and sixty-two dollars, and um, that's per pupil. Sorry. For Minneapolis and St. Paul, one thousand five hundred six. With this new certification max, um, the statewide per pupil is eight hundred ninety-six dollars. Minneapolis, two thousand ninety-six. So we are inadvertently creating more disparities between rural schools and metro schools, and even amongst metro schools. And I think we need to look at that more closely. But even more, and I'd just like to add this, um, I always think, and this is maybe a funding issue more for the funding committee, but I'll say that in a, additional funding is, is awesome, but we need to make sure it's smart funding. And I guess my question is, has compensatory funding actually improved academics over the last, it's been 20 years since we had major funding overhaul for this program. And I don't see the evidence that it has improved anything. Um, reading scores over the last 20 years have gone down, 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 math. And then same with our achievement gap has grown over that time. <coughs> and so I think we need to look at here, um, is it accomplishing what we want to? And if it's not, we should tweak it. I'm not saying get rid of the program, but not just tweak it, but make some innovative changes. Like perhaps we could just give dis districts more opportunity and flexibility for innovation. Tell them that we want this is intended for promoting academic achievement, lifelong learning, and then leave it to them to determine and target those students as to how they're going to use that funding. Because what we're doing now with this money is not working, and simply putting more money into it that's not going to solve the problem either. We're, we need to make some core changes. So I would just add that I would love to see more innovation allowed, more flexibility for school districts so that we're smartly funding and not simply funding. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And I've been misreading the signals here. Um, we do have two more people that would like to speak, but appreciate your comments. Um, any, any specific uh, reply? Representative Feist. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett. Um, I have a few thoughts in response. Um, the first is just that um, equal is not necessarily equitable. And so the kind of point of having compensatory revenue is that we have identified certain students that do need extra investment and support. And so I just wanted to make that point. Um, the second point you made, I love. And I actually, when we were thinking about compensatory revenue and what we wanted to do here, um, one of the questions I kind of threw out there is, do we want to like, 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 like right now we're just like, what is the proxy? Let's find a better proxy that's more workable and gets us to like 100% of what we want. Um, but do we want to rethink <laughs> compensatory revenue and, um, and, and what we want to achieve with this portion of our education budget, which is very significant? Um, we decided not to tackle that this year, but I'd be very interested in continuing the conversation um, because I do think that it's worth thinking about. Um, I will point out, lastly, that, I mean, the, the Office of the Legislative Auditor did, like, a really deep dive. Like, I think the full report's, like, 100 pages. And I've got their key recommendations here. And, you know, none of their recommendations were, like, throw it out. Like, this is dumb. <laughs> like, it's not achieving anything. So, I mean, I, I assume that if the OLA thought that compensatory revenue was, like, a terrible, terrible idea, that that would have been part of their key recommendations, is just, just like, rethink this whole huge part of our education budget, and they didn't say that. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of states, I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many states have a compensatory revenue-esque part of their education budget, but it is a lot of them. So, so I, I think that it comes from a place that is data-driven, um, but I, I also don't think that we should just assume because we've done it this way for a while that we should just keep doing the same thing. Um, so, so yeah, I appreciate your comments. I just have a follow-up, Madam Chair, since we're on this rolling. And thank you. And I, I'd love to work with you on that. Just uh, thinking outside the box, I think, is good. And I am not advocating um, jettisoning this program. But I am saying that we really need to look at, is it working? Because we should always be asking that. And this is the perfect committee to ask, how can we make it work better? Mm -hmm. and, and measuring input, you know, what's, how much money we're giving for this type of student, that type of student is not what we should really be focusing on. We should be focusing on the outcomes, and I'm not seeing the outcomes showing that the input is really working. So um, at this, with this bill right now, I have a difficult time supporting it. If we can add more innovation and, and try to make this 
whatever, work better, then I would be more in support. Thank you. Can, can, can I, Madam Chair, can I start? Yeah. Um, thanks. I, I would be really happy. Thank you. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I'd be happy to talk. I think the acceptable uses portion here is where that conversation should live. So I'd be happy to continue that conversation. Thanks. Representative Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. And sorry for the confusion. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> on, on that. No. Representative Feist, thank you for bringing this bill. I got to tell you, uh, about a month ago now, I was speaking to a room full of educators, and they were excited about the idea of all students having universal access to, to breakfast and lunch. And they were also concerned, as President Lee mentioned, about um, not being able to capture those students for this compensatory aid. And I said, we've got some smart people at the legislature, and there's somebody working on this, and they thought about this. So thank you for making me right. I appreciate that, and good job on this. Uh, just one of the one of the questions I had uh, was in reference to what um, Representative Bennett said about creating this, increasing this gap between the, the funding, um, because now we're going to be capturing more folks. And, and and part of me, I think, that points out one of the issues that we really have. Right, we've got high levels of concentrated poverty in certain areas and certain districts within our state, and and largely it's in the metro area because that's where a lot of people live. Right. So is that correct? Is that we're, seeing, we're going to see an increase because we're going to see more money flow because of those high levels of poverty concentrated in those particular school districts. Is that correct? Representative Feist. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the way the formula works is it, is it has that concentration formula or as concentration factor. Um, and so where there are higher levels of poverty, then then it's not just dollar for dollar. There is like a compression, like you get more, yeah. um, up to 80%. Yeah. Um, and I will mention that we looked at that 80% cap and we considered eliminating it um, and decided that that would not be equitable when looking at statewide funding, and so so we made the decision not to do that. Um, so so I think, but it, but it absolutely does target more dollars based on high concentrations of poverty, and there is a reason for that. It's because we know those schools need that extra level of yeah. support um, and funding. So if we eradicate poverty, we don't have this issue, do we? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Let's do that too. All right. Thank That's, you. Thank you, Representative. That's Fox. innovative thinking. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Chair Joachim, did you have another comment for us? Uh, thank you, or Madam question. Chair. And actually more kind of a question, because I know you've done a deep dive into this, Representative Feist. We, um, when we do formulas and do correlations, and it's for a calculation for need, not necessarily, like you said, dollar for dollar. So this is just a way to look at what are some of the indicators that have been scientifically proven to show that we're having kids fall behind and they need this intensive help. So is, is, am I right on that? Because you've studied this even more than I have. Representative Feist. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Yes, that is the point of these dollars, um, is to target students who are underprepared to learn. Um, and to give you an example of a metric that we considered that's totally impractical, but I think really highlights the types of students we're trying to reach, is the, the level of education of a parent is actually a really good correlation with the types of students who might need this extra support. Um, and so, so we really are targeting students who are you know, maybe experiencing generational poverty, um, have language barriers, um, and, and so we want to, to target these dollars strategically. And, um, and I do think that um, this provision that asks the Department of Education to, to be a resource around best practices that are designed to reach those students, to help them um, to, to achieve, um, to address the opportunity gap. I think that will be really meaningful. Um, and, and I do really look forward to the conversation around acceptable uses, because we really do want to make sure that we don't, like this, we don't want this to just be part of the education budget that's spent on toilet paper and tampons. Um, but um, you know, we want it to be really targeting um, students who like are having challenges with literacy, math, um, you know, who, who need those extra supports. And we just don't, we don't want it to be just like part of the bottom line general fund for a school. Madam Chair, just quick follow up. Chair, you came. And I, I, I did reread that OLA report, the executive summary, and you are tackling four of the five key recommendations. So thank you for that. And maybe I can just ask a question um, just to prepare maybe Representative Bennett offline. We don't have a fiscal note or runs for this. So the numbers that you were stating and the disparity, we haven't even gotten a fiscal note on it. So I'd be curious to find out where you got those numbers. But mm -hmm. that can be done offline. Thank right. you. 
And we look forward to the education finance discussion of this, too. Uh, closing comments, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the really great conversation. As I said, you know, like for me, the most important thing here, um, at, like the most important urgent thing is that we make sure that schools receive the funding that they need, the compensatory revenue that they have, that they rely upon. Um, and, and so um, that is what this bill seeks to achieve. But I think that that um, looking at the acceptable uses and the other policy tweaks that we've made, I think this is an important step forward, and um, I would uh, hope you all can support it. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Feist, and, and thank you for the work that you've done on this. I think a lot of people have recognized that this is something um, for various reasons and now is comp particularly compelling um, that we had to take a look at make a change now, um, even as we keep revisiting it and, and try to direct our um, dollars to where they have the biggest impact on, on the students that are, have the greatest need. So thank you. Thank you for bringing this forward. Um, so I will uh, re renew Representative Feist's motion to re-refer House File 1547 to the Education Finance Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. All right. Um, the ayes have it. and. Uh, our bill is moving to education finance. Thank you, Representative Weiss. All right, so we'll move to our next bill, which is House File 1224. And uh, again, I'll remind the committee we've had an initial overview from, um, from Pelsby, our Pelsby organization, and their first presentation. They did give an overview of um, different, uh, their different bills. Um, then uh, this bill was laid over because we were working on an amendment for it, uh, 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 Representative Hill. And now we will hear the presentation. Um, and we are looking forward to the discussion. All right. So up for consideration is House File 1224. And members, it is our intention to re-refer House File 1224 to the Education Finance Committee. All right. Um, and uh, Vice Chair Hill, would you like to make that motion? For re referral. So moved. Thank you, Chair Breyer. All right. Thank you. All right. So we have House, House File 1224 before us. Uh, Representative Hill, please introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your um, introduction. Oh, and I'm sorry, we do have amendments on this. All right. So, and we actually are got the paper copies of the amendments now. So we do have two authors' amendments. Um, and would you like to motion the A2 amendment? first uh, before the committee, um, Representative Hill. Yes, thank you, Chair Pryor. So move. All right. And again, these are, you know, we, this is not a bill that we really discussed before because we wanted to discuss it with the amendments in place. Um, and so that is, uh, this is getting the, the uh, um, bill in the, in the shape that the offer would like to propose it for discussion. Uh, brief mention of what the A2 amendment is, Representative Hill. Yes, thank you, Chair Pryor. The A2 amendment includes okay. the legacy language uh, that allows for those uh, holding a Tier 2 license uh, to move to a Tier 3 uh, licensure and to complete their coursework requirements um, as we move forward. Uh, what this means in, in uh, la like uh, everyday language would be the following, that there are um, zero Tier 2 teachers today that will not have the opportunity to move through the current uh, pathway to a tier three. Uh, and they will have until December 31st of 2026. Is that the correct date, Dr. Bailey? To complete those requirements. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. <laughs> I think we do have an issue with sound today. Yeah. So sorry, sorry folks. I think it's in the room that our problem is. Um, I'll, I'll right. crank up the volume, Representative Feist. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Representative Hill. So um, first we will uh, vote to adapt the, if, if there's no discussion at this point, because um, we do want to get to the actual testimony for this bill, um, we'll adopt the A2 amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? All right. Thank you. And now we also also have an A1 amendment. All right, when we brought forward the A1 amendment, we noticed that um, it was not actually done in the way that we wanted. It has uh, a date that's not gonna be relevant. Um, and so what we would like to do is just to divide the amendment and just accept the second part because it's the first part of the amendment that needs that 
basically we're doing a technical correction here. Um, and and, and Ms. Ms. Perra, would you just quickly address um, and confirm what I'm saying? <laughs> um, yes, Madam Chair. Um, so lines 1.2 and 1 point to 1 1.4 of the A1 amendment um, are no longer necessary because of the A2. Um, what, what those two lines did was um, create that kind of legacy, that was kind of the legacy language for the candidates moving from tier two to tier three. Instead now in the A2 amendment um, that was just adopted from lines 1.11 to 1.18, that's the language that now has um, allows those applicants to still use that, that pathway um, through 2026. Mm -hmm. So the, the, li the lines that um, the committee would be looking to adopt of the A1 amendment would be lines 1.5 to 1.23. All right, and so because we, we did adopt the um, A2 amendment, those lines in the A1 amendment are no longer necessary, so we only, we're dividing the amendment and just accepting the second part of the amendment. So if that's satisfactory and clear to the committee at this point, um, or clear enough that we feel like we can proceed, um, we'll vote to adopt um, the divided amendment to the second part of the amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. I think we have the bill in the order that you uh, would like to discuss it. Um, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Pryor, and also thank you to our nonpartisan staff for their incredible work in uh, kind of the early uh, committee timeline this more, uh, this afternoon, the gymnastics that we went through to get that right. So really appreciate your work there. I am Josiah Hill. I represent uh, House District 33B in the East Metro along the St. Croix River. Um, I want to thank you, Chair Pryor, for this opportunity, members, for your time here and would like to introduce House File 1224. I feel like I've been before you quite a bit. Uh, over the last few weeks, and so I uh, also thank you for putting up with uh, the process and, and the timeline here. This bill seeks to achieve two items here, and, and the version of this bill has been passed through the House Committee structure in each of the past two biennium periods. This bill was carried uh, in the past by current Senator Kunish and uh, Representative Frazier in both uh, 19 and 21 respectively. And the first thing that this bill seeks to do is to shift the pathway through the tiered licensure structure with the intent of addressing the needs exhibited by many of our new to the field colleagues, and in particular what we have learned from those who have opted out of the profession after a short stay in our classrooms. This bill also seeks to add supports to those who hold a tier two license as they move through the tiered structure towards obtaining license, uh, sure, uh, excuse me, a continual renewal license, sure, that would be a tier three or a tier four license. This bill includes appropriations in three key areas that seek to achieve these first two ends that I've talked about. The first appropriation is $400,000 per year to provide grants to districts and charter schools uh, to support their tier two license holders through an alternative preparation program or licensure via the portfolio process. It's gonna allow them to utilize those dollars to provide PD, mentorship, or even coursework tuition that aligns with state standards for teacher licensure. Secondly, the, there is an appropriation for $50,000 one time to complete the portfolio licensure online platform, and this will allow to streamline the portfolio submission and review process. The third appropriation that uh, this bill <coughs> seeks to uh, move forward with is $150,000 per year to fund a new Pelsby uh, position to support teacher candidates through alternative licensure programs and the licensure via portfolio process. This position would also support districts, charter schools, and cooperatives that would like to explore becoming alternative teacher preparation providers. And I, I know that this is an, uh, an element that's uh, very well, uh, very much needed as I've worked with colleagues who have attempted to move through that portfolio process in the last few years. And, uh, sat with them as they went through some of the different challenges and, and barriers there. I'd also like to acknowledge that there have been several concerns raised regarding this bill, and uh, I think it's important to note that amendments have been made to this bill to ensure that all current Tier 2 license holders will be able to continue on their existing pathway to a Tier 3 license. I think it's also important to note that this bill will not remove any current teachers from the classroom 
or prevent them from continuing to serve Minnesota students. I'm happy to and open to and will continue to work with and understand concerns as we move forward uh, through this process as this bill moves through the committee structure. Um, the tiered structure and its pathways was arrived at via a compromise in 2017 with then Governor Mark Dayton and uh, lawmakers. Uh, this uh, provisions like these uh, were vetoed twice by then Governor Dayton and uh, arrived at it, that compromise uh, at the final finish line of session. This bill is an attempt to improve the pathways to ongoing licensure and to ensure that our new teachers are equipped to find long-term success in serving students and families. As we move forward, uh, I look forward to hearing first from uh, our Pelsby colleagues, Dr. Bailey and Ms. Vought, and then from our, um, those who are going to provide testimony. Looking forward to the inputs and the ongoing work ahead. Thank you. All right, and I'm, I'm hoping we can keep our comments very brief so that we can move to the public testimony. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. For the record, I am Dr. Elena Bailey, the Interim Executive Director of Pelsby. We do have a couple of quick slides we just wanted to reiterate and show you before you hear testimony to provide some context for your questions later. Um, the first item we wanted to review, we know we briefly discussed this last week, is just to reiterate some of the misconceptions and facts related to um, this bill. So one, you've heard that um, this change would remove teachers from the classroom. We wanted to reassure you that that is not the case, that if anything, this bill may change which license an individual holds. But for those who would be moved to a tier one license, there is unlimited renewals for all of the shortage areas, which is almost all of our licensure areas, unfortunately, right now. So no one would be removed. Also, you may hear from testifiers who um, often are confused by our tiered licensure system because it is complicated and use this pathway because they don't know they are eligible for a tier three license via other means. So we often have folks who hold our career and technical education licenses who use this pathway because they don't realize that their work-based experience and the professional certificates would make them be able to do the portfolio in an expedited process. So they often only have to meet a few standards and then they can get that full professional license. Or we have folks from out of state who use this pathway, not realizing that their few years of experience here in Minnesota, plus their professional license in, say, Michigan, would allow them to get that full professional license here without having to use the pathway that is being removed through this bill. So just clarifying that often the complications of tiered licensure cause even our public and our teachers not to understand that this isn't a pathway they actually have to use. The other one is that um, these changes harm teachers of color, and we just quickly want to show you a couple of data points that help clarify that. Um, you'll hear from folks a broad discussion of the fact that 30% of people who hold a tier two license are individuals of color, but the reality of the people who actually use this pathway to get a professional license, there are 17 people over the past five years, people of color, who have used this to get a professional license, so it's a small number. Um, this is just to visually show you, out of all of our classroom teachers last year, 0.2% of the folks that would be in the classroom use this pathway to get their full professional license. It's a very small sliver that you can barely see on this graph. Um, and then lastly, let me just show you, this gives you a visual, particularly when we're talking about teachers of color, which is a very valid and important concern. Again, Pelsby affirms the need for more teachers of color in the state. Um, but we also affirm the need to recognize people of color's capacity to meet standards. I, of course, again, I reiterated this last week, find it insulting as a black woman to believe I cannot meet standards. I'm fully capable. What I do need, and people like me need, is reduction of structural barriers, which is what this and other bills are trying to do. The last thing I'll just say is that you can see visually here on the left, this shows you out of the all of our teachers of color who would be impacted by the policies proposed by Representative Hill's bills. The blue sliver are the people, the 17 people who use the tier two to tier three experience pathway. The large green swath are the people that would be brought into professional licensure with the removal of those exams. So a bit of a contrast there. And then the image on the right shows you out of all of our teachers of color currently professionally licensed in the state, that small blue sliver are the 17 people who use this pathway. So just so you have a, a real kind of understanding of the actual numbers that we're dealing with here, and that even of those 17 or 99 people, many of them could have gotten their professional license through other means, through our support. I will end there. And then open. Thank you. 
Thank you, I, Dr. Bailey. And, and um, Chair Pryor, I think at this point it'd be great to hear from uh, those who are going to provide test testimony. All right. Uh, first up, I have Dr. Sarah Ford, and then we'll have on remote uh, Paul Patier and Kristen Damer, um, and I'll be, we'll be um, going there. All right. Dr. Sarah Ford, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. My name is Dr. Sarah Ford with Education Minnesota, and I'm here to provide some context for the language in House File 1224. One way to approach the teacher shortage is to address the reason teachers leave. A full third of our new teachers don't stay beyond the first five years, and teachers of color are leaving the profession at a higher rate than our white counterparts. The other approach, the one Minnesota has adopted for the past decade, is to focus only on removing requirements around who districts can hire. This approach ignores the needs of students and our inexcusable opportunity and gaps, and it puts the teacher attrition rate into overdrive, making long-term problems worse. Teachers who do not have content and pedagogical training leave at two to three times the rate of teachers who are fully prepared. In Minnesota, the students who are most likely to be taught by teachers without any preparation at all are students in our, um, in our, special, ed, our special education students and our students of color. They are the most likely to face a revolving door of educators Losing out on the ability to develop the long-term relationships upon which so much development and learning relies. I want to be clear, this is not the fault of the caring and compassionate folks who come into Tier 1 and Tier 2. Students need them. We need all of them, including, above all, equitable numbers of teachers of color and indigenous teachers. And they need, those students need their teachers to have access to and all of the benefits and resources that come with high retention teacher preparation. Proposals that support teacher candidates through high retention teacher preparation and provide all students with fully prepared teachers matter a great deal. Please support this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We'll go to our two remote testifiers. First, Paul Patil. And um, we will be timing, and, and we're hoping that this is a two-minute presentation. Oh, yep. Are we ready? Is this going to happen? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Try it. Try again. Madam Chair, can you hear me? We can hear you, but it's soft. It's soft. Well, I will try and speak up. Thank you. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, everyone, thank you. My name is Paul Peltier, and I'm a band and choir teacher in Boston, Minnesota. I am also a board member on the Professional Educators Licensing and Standards Board. My classroom is 265 miles from your hearing room today. I am here to speak with you about making sure we have qualified educators in Minnesota schools and passing House File 1224. It's hard to recruit and retain teachers in Greater Minnesota, and it gets harder when they're not trained with the skills they need to make it in the classroom for the long haul. Many are being left to fail, and House File 1224 allows us to fix that. I'm a Minnesotan, but I started out teaching in North Dakota on a non-traditional path. I had to rise to the occasion and show experience of teacher prep in order to continue to teach. I urge Minnesota to do the same. I have seen underprepared and unprepared teachers who are good with kids, but they're short on skills. They're not getting the help and training they need to effectively serve students in the classroom. Our standards of effective practice are just that, standards. They're there for a reason, because they're tied to student outcomes. I have seen some special ed colleagues struggle. They struggle with paperwork and knowing how to teach. What ends up happening is that veteran staff have to pick up the workload. This increases staffing stress and leads to more burnout. If they don't last, a new person is hired and the veteran staff have to begin what feels like a never ending cycle of retraining another new person. To expect administrators to fill the prep gap is unrealistic and unfair, especially when many of them are not trained in teacher preparation. And finally, as a member of the Professional Educators Licensing and Standards Board, and currently one of only two active public school classroom teachers serving today, I am keenly aware of what happens when underprepared colleagues join my school staff team and are my neighbors. The challenge is significant in greater Minnesota where I teach, but guess what? Teaching's a professional job. It's about time we trust teachers to say what we need. Let us lead on teacher things. And what we have said is we need colleagues who are trained to do the job. Thank you for the opportunity, and please pass House File 1224. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peltier. Next up, we have Kristen Damer. Can you hear me? Thank you. Please, yes, please introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kristen Damer. I'm an Assistant Superintendent of Business and Administrative Services for the Moorhead Area Public Schools. I'm speaking today in opposition of House File 1224 and the proposed changes to tiered licensure. The Tier 2 pathway recognizes successful teaching experience in a classroom and provides qualified teachers that have knowledge and experience in subjects such as math, science, special education, and career and technical education. <laughs> Misconceptions regarding the removal of Tier 2 and Tier 3 were presented to the committee both today and in previous meetings. From my experience, these are not misconceptions, but factual outcomes of additional licensure barriers. This will remove teachers from the classroom as Tier 1 and Tier 2 have no protections for continuing contract, which is not sustainable for long-term employment. <coughs> With required posting positions, a district would be required to lay off Tier 1 and Tier 2 teachers and hire a teacher with teacher preparation coursework, regardless of experience or effectiveness. This could harm teachers of applicants, could harm teachers or applicants of color as any removal of a pathway which eliminates barriers to licensure could harm historically marginalized communities. The pathway is not a means to hold individuals to a lesser standard, but to eliminate a barrier similar to House File 1257, which removes a potential testing barrier through alternative pathway. This is, fails to consider district hiring concerns. Applications eligible for pathway can often only be approved due to lack of candidates with teacher preparation or extensive reasoning on why those candidates are not qualified. The messaging has been clear to districts. Ineffective applicants with teacher preparation could hinder the hire and licensing of effective tier one or tier two applicants. There's also a misconception that there's a significant deficit in classroom management without teacher preparation coursework. In a review of one Minnesota preparation program, there's not a single class focusing on classroom management. However, districts often provide support and professional development to provide classroom management tools, regardless of the tier experience and recognize the support need and improvement across participants. In closing, I urge you to reconsider um, House File 1224. Eliminating this pathway will make already significant teacher shortage more urgent and will leave districts without teachers, teachers who bring knowledge and experience that benefit our programs and most of all, our students. Thank you again for your time and listening to my testimony. Thank you. So I'm going to call up um, the next presenters, Jamie Peterson and Crystal Brake. Brake. Um, and if you, you probably can, well, you can be uh, <laughs> the, the, you can be on deck for the next for the next one. And then after that, we'll have a remote testifier. Thank you. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Peterson. How's that? Okay. All right. Good afternoon, Madam Chair Pryor and committee members. My name is Jamie Peterson. I am a tier two teacher at Anoka Hennepin School District. My license is a career and technical education or CTE license in teacher of hospitality careers. I stepped into the classroom with 17 years of hospitality and food service experience. Daily, I bring with me a lifetime of training young adults through their career pathways in hospitality and food service. I have been teaching in the school district for six years. The proposed changes of House File 1224 would be catastrophic to CTE teachers like me across the state. Eliminating the option to move from Tier 2 to Tier 3 through successful years of experience teaching will cause us to lose highly successful teachers across the state and schools would likely lose programs that meet the needs for our workforce. CTE teachers do not have post-secondary programs or alternative prep programs for most of our licensure areas. It is important to note that Tier 1 and Tier 2 teachers are not eligible for tenure, equating to continuously reapplying for a job while the district is required to look for a Tier 3 or Tier 4 teacher. In many of our CT areas, that teacher, Tier 3 and tier, tier 4 teacher does not exist. Perpetual renewals for Tier 1 and Tier 2 licenses in high need areas will do nothing to support, attract, or retain new and talented teachers. As a probationary teacher, I have been formally observed by an administrator 18 times. I participate in QComp, a tool to better support teachers in developing their professional practice, and I've worked with teacher mentors. I participate in a collaborative team to assure our students are meeting standards and are achieving, and I participate in professional development multiple times every year with earnest. After many years as a probationary teacher, my district can assure you that I have met the standards for effective practice for teachers. 
and to and, tackle and inclusion. Ms. Peterson, and I know um, we, we, that was, um, we only have so much time for the public testimony per, per person. Your written testimony though, um, please provide it and we'll make sure that the complete, um, uh, complete testimony is available. If you have a closing thought before we move on. All right, um, to tackle inclusion, we have to be inclusive of our community's skill set. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you. We have uh, Crystal Brick. And, and we are strict on time, so I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for your time. My name is Crystal Brackey, and I am here as a school board member in both Richfield Public Schools and Intermediate School District 287. In addition to my role as chair of the Association of Metropolitan <coughs> School Districts and a member of the Minnesota School Boards Association. I wanna start by thanking Representative Hill for the amendments to this bill. We have 32 tier two teachers in Intermediate District 287. This group of teachers is significantly more racially diverse than our teachers in the district or the state and I am heartened that these educators will have their pathway to tier three licensure preserved and supported under the, these amendments. At the same time, I still have questions and concerns regarding the broader effort to eliminate the tier two to tier three pathway to licensure. We are in a teacher shortage and the governor and this legislative body are proposing to invest millions as a state in addressing this growing crisis. I support that investment, especially in our shortage areas and in particular as it relates to diversifying our teaching force. It's difficult to reconcile that investment when at the same time you are considering taking steps that could make it more challenging for future teachers in Minnesota classrooms to stay here. It's hard to understand this change in the absence of data or research indicating our current tiered licensure approach is ineffective. I have yet to see any student-centered evidence that it isn't working. As a school board member, when policies are brought forward for review and change, I ask myself, who is being advantaged and who is being disadvantaged by these changes. I hope that as you consider changes to our existing tiered licensure system, you are asking the same questions and that you work with the districts and schools you represent as you come to your answers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bracke. Uh, next, we have on remote, uh, Philip Anodi. If you can hear us, please identify yourself and proceed. Hello, um, can you all hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and the committee. Uh, my name is Adewale Philip Adenodi. I go by he, him pronouns. I'm a social studies teacher at Henry High School in Minneapolis. Uh, and I'm here uh, to talk about um, how I feel and my perspective around House File uh, 1224. So um, when I think about uh, what it means to um, become an educator, I think about my students who are currently in the education pathway program um, at our school. And I think about my friends and my uh, the people in my community who have tried to navigate um, uh, our current tiered system and our systems um, that's previously existed. Uh, I think about uh, what it would mean to eliminate an additional pathway for them to get licensure. Um, many friends and many uh, family members, all of whom, uh, many friends and many community members, all of whom are black and brown, have struggled to get access to things, um, to get access to uh, the qualification, either because of money or either because of uh, tensions and issues within their licensure programs, because there are uh, incidences that lead uh, around race, around gender and sexuality that leads to the exclusion of uh, educators of color and marginalized educators within those education programs. Um, and I think we need to be aware of that when we're eliminating the three years of experience that could be beneficial for someone to maintain an educator's life um, uh, tier three license. Um, we should not be restricting um, pathways that could help and aid in the expansion of more teachers of color and additionally, before uh, I end my comments, I would like and, y'all. And I'm, I'm to so sorry. We are we are um, at our time limit right now. And do you have a concluding thought? Um, 
I want y'all to think about how can you maintain the three years, but also put support with each year a uh, teacher is. All right, uh, thank, thank you for yeah. that concluding thought. We really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, next up, um, well, we have two last testifiers, if we can be ready. First is Habin Gabe Gergic. And if you can, and then uh, Laura Mogelson is our last, so you can be ready. Please proceed. All right, good afternoon, Chair, and the rest of the members of the committee. My name is Haben Gebregurgish, and I've been a practicing tier two licensed math educator in St. Paul for four years at the High School for Recording Arts. I attended public schools in St. Paul, and it's an honor to give back today. I'm a first generation college student who graduated with honors from the University of Chicago. After college, I taught high school mathematics for four years in uh, Detroit, Michigan, and received my professional, provisional teaching license from the University of Michigan. On my path to licensure, I had to attend weekly evening classes and monthly Saturday professional development sessions for two years. I also had to submit a portfolio that included my vision and mission as a teacher and of my long body of work. I also received monthly observation reports from coaches who were committed to helping me develop as an educator. When I moved back to Minnesota, the tier two licensure option allowed me to remain in the classroom while, while, while I worked on my master's degree. I now have my master's degree in education from Hamlin University and am well on my way to moving up to a tier three license through the state exams and my four plus years of successful teaching in Minnesota. In addition to teaching mathematics, I'm a teacher leader who facilitates professional training opportunities and consults with my administration on a variety of issues related to effective instruction. I have presented at numerous conferences all over the country to help teachers develop project-based learning curricula. My school, like many schools, is experiencing a shortage of caring and effective teachers. And one of our solutions has been to identify non-teachers, such as advisors, who have the desire and the qualifications to be great teachers through this licensure pathway. We currently have several people on staff who are tier one licensed working on their tier two licensure who would no longer be able to continue working if this bill passes. If the bill currently being debated had existed when I moved back to Minnesota, I would not have been able to re-enter teaching the way that I did. I might have missed the opportunity to teach at the amazing school that I do now. I oppose this bill because it will directly affect the new teachers I'm working to support at my school and future teachers in similar situations as me. As someone who took the non-traditional route to education and know many people who have, I can assure you that there are many brilliant and caring professionals that will be discouraged from becoming teachers if the pathways to tier two and tier three licensure are further restricted. Given the current shortage, this is not something we can afford to do. Equally concerning, brilliant educators of color will be disproportionately affected, which will in turn harm students. Thank you. How am I doing on time? That, can that I, can be, I make my concluding phrase? A, a concluding <laughs> phrase, thank you. Um, so my concluding phrase is that rather than um, take away the flexible pathways to licensure, we should continue to support teachers that are in the classroom um, and invest in professional development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our last is Laura Mogelson. Madam Chair. Members of the committee, uh, my name is Laura Mogelson, and I'm here from the Minnesota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education, or MACT. We are in support of House File 1224. This bill limits the situations in which the Tier 2 to Tier 3 pathway can be utilized. There are multiple ways a teacher can earn a Tier 3 license, including higher education, alternative preparation, and licensure via portfolio. All other pathways to licensure require teachers to show that they have mastered content standards and general pedagogy standards. They also need to meet statutory requirements, such as teaching reading, working with multilingual learners, and addressing the needs of students with dyslexia. Aren't these things important? Why have a pathway that allows some teachers to not learn these things? Why have standards and laws at all if we aren't required to follow them? We are especially concerned regarding special education teachers moving to a tier three without training, given the federal laws around credentialing. Uh, Pelsby's data shows that one third of teachers who hold a tier two have completed teacher preparation. About 30% of these teachers are teachers of color. The only barrier to them obtaining a tier three license is passing the licensure exams, which we've discussed already. They have demonstrated evidence of meeting standards through coursework and teaching. We believe that allowing someone to receive a tier three license without meeting the standards is not good for Minnesota's children 
it devalues the teaching profession, and it undermines the authority and credibility of our licensure rules. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Having no more testifiers, uh, we will move to member discussion. It's Representative Knudsen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ed Allies has a handout in our packet here, and I'm just wondering if Josh could possibly explain that. Please, and thank you. Please identify yourself and proceed. Hi, thank you, Madam and, Chair. And if you could keep this explanation short. Yes. So there will be time for member discussion. Absolutely. Yes, Madam Chair, my name is Josh Crossan, uh, Executive Director with Ed Allies, an education advocacy group dedicated to making sure that each and every kid has access to an excellent education. Um, before I start, I'd like to just point out that there are students, families, educators, advocates, people who are impacted by this law who didn't have the opportunity to testify today. Can I just see your hands wave? There they are, families, kids, yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping, Madam Chair, that we'll have an opportunity for more robust conversation on how bills like these will impact the community. Um, so to the proposed, um, or to the, to the one pager, um, first, as it highlights uh, the first section on tier two, this bill would close six of the nine pathways to tier two licensure um, without evidence that closing these pathways actually improves student outcomes or teacher effectiveness. Um, we kind of did a really easy track changes on what that looks like. Before the bill was amended, 800, about 800 teachers would have had their licenses removed. Uh, now that the, the bill has been amended, uh, future teachers, countless teachers, will have not, no access to those, those licenses, but current teachers will have access to keep their licenses. So it's a, a, a clever way to make sure that current teachers can't say that their licenses are being taken away. Um, the second part uh, on tier three, uh, it, it removes a pathway that a teacher can show three years of teaching experience and a good evaluation to become a tier three licensed teacher. Um, and and as, as it was pointed out earlier by Pelsby, about 25% of teachers in tier two are teachers of color. Um, Pelsby has said over and over again that there's a misconception that teachers are not uh, impacted, teachers of color are not impacted. I disagree, there's a disproportionate impact on teachers of color. And they've also said that, um, uh, that we are, we are assuming that teachers of color cannot fulfill the requirements of, of teacher licensure. That is also not true. Uh, we believe that teachers of color can fulfill these requirements, but it is an onerous requirement. $20,000 a year for teacher preparation, time and money spent. Um, I believe that teachers of color can fulfill these requirements. They shouldn't have to. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the amendment, um, as, as, as mentioned, um, would uh, change the definitions of tier two licensure. So we'd have different requirements for tier two licensures, tier two teachers coming in now um, compared to tier two teachers currently in the system. Currently tier two teachers can move up to tier three. The new ones coming in would not be able to move up to tier three and would be pushed out of the classroom after eight years. Um, so I would just like to, to end on, um, you know, teacher, teacher, tier one and tier two teachers really owe nothing to this body. I'll, I'll clearly state that. What they owe the, the majority of their time and energy is to their students. And tier one and tier two teachers are doing an amazing job right now serving their students and their communities. And we hope that this body doesn't take them away or close pathways for those educators. Lastly, I would like to hand out um, Representative Feist opened the door for this, um, but uh, the Office of Legislative Auditor um, heard licensure about uh, in 2017. This proposal is not the, the, in the brains of Republicans or Democrats. It was proposed by the Office of Legislative Auditor saying that our licensure system is broken. We should not re-break our system. So I'd hope to hand this out with the, one of the pages. Thank you. You can give it to the committee minister. Representative Bigford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Hill. Uh, thank you for bringing us this bill and, and, and really the series of Pelsby bills to this point. Uh, I myself, like all of you, have received, I'm sure, a number of emails, a number of concern about this bill and, and the Pelsby bills in general. Uh, and to be blunt, it's for good reason. Uh, the tier two to tier three pathway is not a loophole, as it was referred to before. Um, as, as Pelsby or MDE referred to it, it's a proven pathway that respects classroom experience. As an administrator, teachers get better the more experience that they have. Experience matters. On a practical note, uh, it doesn't matter if a teacher goes through a licensure program or they come through a pathway. 
They need support when they come into the classroom. They need support. Um, and these tier two teachers are being supported and, obs and observed uh, in an ongoing basis. Uh, this bill, in my opinion, discredits the countless hours of support and work by teachers, instructional coaches, and administrators to help these tier two, tier two teachers reach their potential. This bill also disregards the legislative auditor report recommending the option of a tier two license in lieu of teacher prep. I believe this bill is more about protecting teacher licensure programs rather than allowing districts to grow teachers. One of our testifiers asked who's being advantaged. And I would just ask that question, who is being advantaged with this bill? We should be focused on, focusing on expanding pathways for, for people to get into the classroom, expanding pathways, not eliminating them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hill, did you want to make a comment? Thank you, Chair Pryor. Thank you, Representative Bakeberg, Bakeberg for your comments. I think the element of this bill that uh, we seek to add support for our new teachers is what I want to highlight in response. Um, we talked about the three areas of appropriations to be put in place to help support teachers, uh, future teachers in that tier two uh, licensure pool to move forward through that preparation program to gain those supports that you talked about. Many of our districts have indicated that they have challenges, uh, both financial and, and otherwise, surrounding the ability to put these supports, robust supports in place uh, for our new colleagues in the teacher profession. And so that's what this bill seeks to, uh, seeks to do. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Hill. Uh, Representative Yorkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a quick question. Maybe, I think maybe somebody from Pelsby could probably answer it the best. Yes. Dr. Uh, one Bailey? of our testifiers, thank you, Madam Chair. One of our testifiers mentioned um, being a CTE teacher and having this proposed um, changes affecting her. I know we have a, a group of bills moving through that kind of do a lot of wraparound, including what Representative Hill said, which is doing a lot more supports to help districts move their teachers through to a highly qualified teacher and pathway three and four, and also give them more training. But um, does this, would this bill affect CTE teachers? I thought in one of your other bills that kind of takes care of that issue. Dr. Bailey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Yuakim, that's a great question. So CTE uh, is a perfect uh, pathway to talk about portfolio, and I think this is where the misconception is. Because you qualify for your CTE often with a professional certificate, that could be used through the portfolio process to meet all of the content standards. What would remain are a few pedagogical standards. And so what this bill does is it provides that funding then that would allow that person, the district, to pay for the cost of that portfolio. Someone mentioned thousands of dollars for prep. It's a couple hundred bucks to go through portfolio. We already in the state have the innovative alternative pathway built in. And we are one of two states that do that. So the CTE teachers would not be moved out of the classroom or prevented from taking this alternative route. It was actually created with them in mind and others. So yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. Follow up, you Madam to Chair, yes. Another quick question too. Um, I, and I've been paying particular close attention to this because my son's uh, uh, longtime girlfriend is a teacher in another state. And she'll be rounding up her um, third year, I believe. Well, she's finishing up her second, going into her third year. If they were to move back to Minnesota where I'd like them, what would that look like, especially with the supports we're doing in, in other bills? Dr. Bailey. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, it's a great question as well. So with the Removing Barriers bill, we'd actually make it even easier for someone who holds that full professional license in another state to come directly here and get their Tier 4 license. Currently, they can already get their Tier 3 license, and the board has actually adopted policies that take their tests they've taken in other states to count. So they would immediately get their Tier 3 license, and then um, Representative Hill's other bill would make it so that they could actually get their Tier 4. Madam Chair, yes. with your indulgence, one more question, and I want to leave time for other people, too. Um, I, I got a little confused, which is probably easy to do this time of day because I haven't had enough ca caffeine. Um, the OL, an OLA report was mentioned that we didn't have in our packets, but the page that we did get does note that the exhibit provides an example of what a two-tiered license, what a tiered licensing system could look like. Um, it was not what we had set in place. And then we also got another 
handout that mentioned six out of the nine pathways being removed. And I thought we were, in this bill, we were just closing one of them, but doing the legacy language. And then in multiple other bills, we're actually helping enhance and create new pathways. Maybe I'm just not tracking all the stuff we've heard over the last few days, but Dr. anybody Bailey. that could help me out, that would be great. Dr. Bailey. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Buick, I can quickly respond to that. Actually, thanks for the handout as a former professor, I'll use this. So this actually here, they are not eliminated. These folks would just be moved to tier one, which is why I highlighted that because they are most, almost entirely in shortage areas, they can renew indefinitely. Tier one and tier two were designed to fill those shortage, you know, emergent needs. So that would continue, that doesn't change. Uh, these, you know, impact, again, we're talking about 99 people over the past five years, 17 of whom are people of color. So that context is very helpful. There is that change to move this, basically these individuals, there's a, there's a disproportionate comparison of you're enrolled in teacher preparation, you have a master's degree or higher, or you've taken a few credits, passed the test. So all this would do is move that to tier one so that there's more balance between the tiers, that's all. Doesn't take them out of the classroom, and again, they can renew indefinitely because of our shortage. Thank you, appreciate the clarification for this. Um, I'm gonna um, go to uh, Representative Frazier and then after that, Representative Bennett for the discussion today. Thank you. Representative Madam, Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair, I'll be quick. Uh, Dr. Bailey, this question is directed towards you. Is there any, I've, I've heard a lot of conversation around um, data in regards to effective teachers. Um, is there any data that says our tier one and tier two teachers are most effective where our students are the most in need? Dr. Bailey. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Frazier, excellent question. So we do not have data that shows that. Um, in fact, uh, I mean, we hear anecdotal stories, of course, of the great skills they bring, and I do want to recognize and acknowledge that. Um, national research actually shows the opposite, that teachers who have received preparation are more effective. So if you're just looking at you know, national research, which I tend to favor as a, as a researcher myself, it actually shows the opposite of that. Um, so I will, yeah, leave that. We, I will add, though, we do have plenty of data that shows that of the thousands of teachers that have received these Tier 1 and Tier 2 licenses, the majority of them do not actually move up the tiers through this path. We've licensed thousands over the past several years, and only 99 have used it. So our data shows that the majority of them actually leave the classroom, which we can make some inference as to why they're leaving. Some people have mentioned the lack of supports and other items. Um, so I think that that is maybe the data point to focus on. And, and I think that segues, segues into another question. I mean, what I'm seeing with this bill and other legislation that is moving forward, uh, we're gonna be providing uh, potentially more job protections uh, for these individuals, workers' rights for these individuals that are in tier ones. Um, we're also gonna be providing resources so they can get more training, more professional development, which will in turn make them more effective. What I've heard from instructors in these positions, and particularly teachers of color, is that that's what they want. They want those resources to provide them more professional development. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we're putting those things in place. And I think we have to look at this in a more holistic way and take a broader look at what's happening, because we're putting resources in place that are not only going to remove this uh, kind of backdoor away from tier two into tier three, but it's going to provide resources upstream to help those teachers uh, be more effective. And, and what I would argue is that we're going to see more of those teachers actually stay in the classroom and do the job that they want to do and give back to what they want to give back and do what they're passionate about. So thank you for bringing this bill, Representative Hill. Thank you. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members, I feel like this bill is a solution in search of a problem. I don't, I don't hear the problem here of getting rid of this pathway from Tier 2 to Tier 3. I'm hearing accusations that somehow these teachers are less prepared and not as effective. I don't see any evidence of that. I have nobody in my schools, no parents, no uh, administrators saying, hey, this is not working. I'm hearing that um, this is maybe a reason why teachers are quitting. There's no evidence of that, that tier, the ones using this pathway are the teachers quitting. There's teachers quitting for many reasons. I was here back when this was negotiated and it was a true compromise. We worked hard, Representative Erickson and others, to, to work together to create a pathway. And by the way, as, as another um, testifier said, this was something that was recommended by the OLA. And we just passed a previous bill, uh, House File 1547, that was in part based on recommended recommendations by the OLA. And so 
we're dumping all of those compromises, and they were true compromises because our side gave things up to get this. This was fought against greatly, and there's a lot of reasons why, and I won't get into them, but I don't believe in the end that they were valid in that we're not showing that there's any problem here. So I really question why we're trying to fix something that's not a problem, reducing a path pathway, and taking away true compromise that happened back when this was passed. I don't see that as compromise at all, Madam Chair. And I would ask, actually, Madam Chair, that this be laid on the table. We have a lot of testifiers that were not able to come up and testify. And they, they deserve that right to come up and testify. So I would ask for a roll call on that too, Madam Chair. All right, so if I understand it, uh, to build to be laid on the table and we'll do a vote um, and a roll call vote on that. Um, so if the committee uh, legislative assistant um, would would do the roll call vote. Uh, Chair Pryor. No. Um, Vice Chair Hill. No. Weed Bennett. Yes. Representative Baker. Yes. Uh, Representative Berg. No. Uh, Representative Feist. No. Representative Frazier. No. Um, Representative Keeler. No. Representative Knutson. Yes. Representative Lee. No. Representative Mueller. Mueller votes yes. Representative Joachim. No. With um, four ayes and eight nays. Uh, the motion does not carry. We will not be laying it on, uh, laying it on the table. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, closing remarks, and thank you, thank you, uh, Representative Hill, for being with us and, and carrying this and moving it forward. Um, not not an easy bill. Well, I, I thank you, Chair Pryor, for the opportunity to be here and members as well uh, here in committee. Thank you to those who provided testimony here today. Uh, very much important part of our, our evolution as we move forward, and we look forward to ongoing conversation. Uh, we're hoping to move this on to Ed Finance, and there will be additional opportunity there for both that ongoing <laughs> conversation and to, to hear from those who want to share their, their inputs into the process. So we look forward to that. Uh, much like we don't put um, brand new employees into the C-suite or into the, the boardroom, much like we uh, have uh, an opportunity to develop uh, members of teams, whether that's in an athletic sense or otherwise, uh, before putting them out there against the greatest opposition, uh, we want to develop their tools. And my hope is that these uh, bills, uh, individually and especially working together, will provide what our uh, future teachers need to be equipped to be successful for a, a long-term career as we move forward to serve the needs of students and parents. That's the intent, and we will continue to do the work to try to arrive at that end. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Vice Chair Hill renews his motion to re-refer House File 1224 as amended to the Education Finance Committee. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Uh, the motion carries, and the bill is re-referred to Education Finance. And the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>